Okay. Well, hello and welcome to tonight's forum, Working Together Towards a Sound Energy Future, sponsored by the Town of Nantucket Energy Office and presented by National Grid. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Lauren Sinatra. I'm the town's energy coordinator. And over the last several years, it's been my pleasure to work closely and collaboratively with the, Nan with the National Grid team to improve energy efficiency programs on Nantucket and to increase public awareness about Nantucket's peak load situation. In tonight's presentation, National Grid is here to explain how Nantucket's demand for electricity has grown in recent years and what this means for the future of the island. They will also highlight what we as a community can do to both help immediately and over the long term. So please join me in welcoming our first speaker tonight, Mr. Tim Rowan, Director of Energy and Environmental Policy, who will act as tonight's moderator. Great, thank you so much, Lauren. Yeah, no, it's been, uh, we're here about uh, last December, if I recall, uh, with a crowd about the same size talking about the same sort of thing. But we've expanded our thinking a little bit more since then. We wanted to kind of share some of our thoughts, get some uh, input from folks in, in the community as to what, what they would like to see and, uh, you know, how to, and uh, just how to move forward. Uh, Emily Slack, who's with our engineering group, will give us some of the technical details. And Lindsay Foley, who's with our product management group, will give us some details around some of the customer side resources slash stuff that folks can do out there in the community. So first and foremost, we wanted to kind of talk about the fact that, you know, we do this work every day. You know, we manage, we plan our system. Uh, we've got very specific things we need to look at when we plan the system. And uh, with a fairly large company th that we are, so this is what we have here in Massachusetts, uh, if folks are interested, and obviously Nantucket is a very important part of that. So what do we, what do, we do as a, ultimately as an electric utility, right? We provide reliable and safe electric service to everyone. Uh, and no one needs to know the details, right? They just want to know when they flip the switch, there's enough electricity for their, for their PCs, for their air conditioners, for their water heaters, for their electric dryers, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what we do every day. And what we do is we, we manage and plan our system to optimize our spend as, as, uh, as, uh, as best we can. And that becomes a key parameter as we go forward here when we talk with customers about what they can do on their side of the electric meter. Because we talk about leveraging monies. We all, if you look at your electric bill, there's lots of different line items. There's uh, line items for the local electric stuff that uh, folks locally manage for you. There's uh, stuff on the thing that's, that pay for energy efficiency funds and others. And is there a way to leverage some of those other uh, funds, especially things like efficiency, and frankly, some subsidies that are also available for things like renewable energy systems, uh, solar projects, and that sort of thing and try to leverage some of those dollars that we're already collecting from our customers, again, to try to optimize as best as we can the dollars we need to spend to keep, to keep the system as safe and as reliable as we can. And obviously, we're a regulated uh, um, electric utility by the Mass Department of Public Utilities, and we'll be talking about them a, a little bit more as we go forward here. So just want to talk about what we're going to uh, tonight is where we see things going. If uh, folks saw some of the other things we presented in December uh, and uh, other times and some of the stuff in the local paper, you know that we're looking at a condition here on Nantucket, at least from last summer, that the electric loads really went quite high and there's some concerns around that from, from a plan, long-term planning, long-term reliability. Now this summer, uh, it was cool. It was uh, ne not nearly as hot, but we have to plan on summers like 2013 and plan on things like the load growth that continues to happen here in the island on our side. And what we're going to talk about tonight is more of a, a project where we can try to leverage some of the customer uh, issues out there, what they want to do, try to get as efficient as they can, and potentially some other work that we, which we would ask our customers to do as well. So first I want to get to uh, Emily Slack, who's our planning, in our planning group, to talk a little about the technical details around the, how the island serves. Emily? All right, so electricity is delivered to Nantucket via two undersea cables that connect the island to the mainland. The first cable was installed in 96, and it starts at Lothrop Avenue substation in Harwich and extends to Candle Street substation here in downtown, downtown Nantucket. It has a capacity of about 38 megawatts. The second cable was installed in 2006. Um, 
it goes from Merchant's Way substation in Hyannis and also ends at Candle Street here on Nantucket. And it has about 36 megawatts of capacity. Under normal operating conditions, each cable serves about half of the electric demand of Nantucket, but they're also there to back each other up. So if we were to lose one cable, which is um, a very low probability event, the other cable could serve the island's load. We also have diesel generation on island that can be used to support um, one cable in the event of an emergency. The peak electric demand in 2013 was about 45 megawatts. Um, like Tim, Tim mentioned, it was a very hot summer. Um, and you'll notice that 45 is greater than either 36 or 38. So under peak conditions, um, we have to look at how to continue supplying um, the island with electricity if we were to lose one cable. Most of the time, the electric demand is less than one cable. This chart shows the average day going back through um, 2008. And as you can see, the demand is well below that red line, which is the capacity of one cable. So if we lost a cable on one of these average days, we wouldn't have any trouble serving the island with one cable. However, peak electric demand is greater than the capacity of one cable um, for some hours, mainly in July and August on those hot summer days. You can see this chart shows the number of hours each year that the demand was greater than the capacity of one cable. So you see in 2008, there are just a few hours. That number grows up through 2013 when there were many hours when we would need to look at other solutions. Um, and the greatest hours of need are between 6 and 10 p.m., again, on those hot July and August days. So National Grid does have a plan to serve customers in the event of the loss of one cable. Like we saw in the first chart, most of the time, all electric demand can be supplied by the remaining in-service cable. And if demand is greater than the capacity of one cable, as we saw in the second chart, on-island and roll-on diesel generation can be used to support the remaining cable. So if we were to lose one cable on one of those peak days when the demand is high, about half of the island would experience an outage initially, the half that's served by the cable that failed. And then within a few hours, we would have most of the island back in service, and we would be using our on-island generation that we keep at Bunker Road and working to get emergency generation on the island um, to meet the peak demand. And um, within a few days, we would be able to have that generation up and running. And there might be some rolling outages in the interim until we get everything going. Um, and we would continue to use that generation until either the cable's fixed or until um, the peak demand period ends and the loads no longer justify using the generation. As I mentioned, we have um, six megawatts of on-site generation that we maintain at Bunker Road. And we can bring on emergency roll-on generators. Um, they can each serve about 1.7 megawatts up to a maximum of 12. That's six generators at Bunker Road and six at Candle Street, um, which is what our physical space permits. So if um, I had been asked this spring how many of those emergency generators we would need to bring on island if we had lost a cable the summer of 2014, I would have said three based on the loads that we saw in 2013 and what we were predicting for this summer. Now knowing how mild the summer turned out to be, we wouldn't actually have needed any of those roll-on generators had we lost the cable this past summer. But as Tim mentioned before, we do have to plan for that hot summer like what we saw in 2013. And based on that hot summer projection, this first chart shows um, our historical and future projected loads. 
And um, you can see that green line is kind of our um, emergency planning threshold. You can see it growing above that, indicating that we need to um, make further plans, which is to bring on increasing levels of emergency generation as the load requires. But we're still well below that orange line, which is our normal capacity situation. Um, are we taking questions now, or? Yes. What's the probability of it's very low. It's a few percent. And the chart in the lower portion of this slide is just comparing the historical and projected growth rates for Nantucket to the rest of the state. And you see that um, both historically and projected Nantucket is growing faster than the rest of the state as a whole. So um, we have a unique situation that we're looking at in terms of load growth. In order to maintain our current level of emergency planning, um, like what we were planning for this past summer. We would need approximately 18 megawatts of load relief um, through 2032. There's a big jump of about three megawatts by 2016, and then it grows by about a megawatt per year after that. So that's the amount that we would need to reduce in order not to bring um, our plans up another notch. And if we manage to reduce the loads by those amount, um, through 2027, we would be able to reduce the amount of generation we would bring on island if there were an emergency. And then um, in 2028 and beyond, we would be looking at the possibility of deferring a third cable, because with our current um, forecasts, we're looking at about 2028, give or take a couple of years, for the need date for that third cable. So we're continuing to look at this problem. Um, right now we're conducting a needs assessment engineering study, looking at the next 20 years of load growth and determining the scope and timeline of any infrastructure that we would need. Um, that includes a third cable. Um, and this study is working to confirm um, the timeline that we would need that third cable in. So now I'm going to hand it off to Lindsay, who's going to talk about some of the energy efficiency measures that we're looking at. There's a question. Can we, uh, so can you guys make a calculation that converts on all the cooling days from this summer to project whether we all of the decrease in demand were weather related? Absolutely decreased in demand. So that's question number one. Question number two, in 2014 it happened in 2012 when you were doing your projections. What would the growth projections look like? And so the third question is, uh, the probability that 2013 was uh, on the one end or the other of the distribution that it's not an event that's you know, got a high probability of occurring again. Okay, um, so you're if you do a calculation on degree days or cooling days, and we convert this year's demand, this summer's demand, uh, and split it between what was which, uh, what was temperature related and what was demand. Let me exact that. Uh, so yes, you can do that analysis. And what we'll do, for example, this year, we we'll have 39 megawatts, and uh, just for context, that's 39 million watts. A lot of them are on the poles. Think about it. Most houses only use three to four thousand watts at peak. Um, a lot of homes on the island use maybe twenty to thirty thousand watts right now. So yes, you can do that, and we will do that. We'll normalize that. What well, we saw, you know, and that's what we'll be able to come up with in terms of how much it was actually by the late. 
expression is highly common in most it was quite early, but again, that's part of the study, the need to set the study which was examined in the final study to determine that. Um, the last question I'll handle before the middle one, the reality is that, you know, uh, as I said earlier, you know, when people go to the switch, they sure expect those lights to be long. So we do have the plan for those extreme events. Uh, that's one of the planning criteria we have. We have to understand what's going to happen in those sorts of events. So, um, and with the way things are going, well, with the climate change and all the rest, I think a lot of us assume we may have to plan for more of those versus less of those, right? Those sort of super kind of long-term. Yeah, but I think to the first question, the question that this gentleman asked, you know, it's a probability question. We way out on the edge of the tail here with a probability event in 2013. And if so, you know, what, I understand that you need to think about it, but if it's got a, you know, 0.003% chance of happening again, I would think your planning would end up being different than it had a 20% chance of happening again. And that's what I was trying to trying to get at where, where do you think we are on the distribution, particularly looking, you know, backwards at, uh, you know, other more summer events? Well, I, in, in terms of the probability, I mean, that's why we're proposing the, the project with as many times off to get a few turned up. Let's get some more time, because it is a crystal ball, right? We have to destiny what we expect things to happen over 20 years here. Lots of things to take us all, the economy, all sorts of different. So it is a crystal ball, and that's why we're looking at a relative uh, four or five year project initially to see how everything goes, to see how frequently the 2013 issue will be, right? Because it's not an easy way to type of probability. It's simply we know we need to meet the need when and if it occurs. That's why we have a lot of this alternative, the short term one being additional generation. Um, well, I'm from your second question, or can I answer it? Or? Yeah, I mean, the second question. Just two questions. One is, what's the cost of cable when we do it? And then two, uh, the topic of peak metering to take care of some of those lumps that might be good just overall. We used to have something like that. And it seemed like it would be fairly straightforward to do something like that. No, we will be talking about that with Lindsay's presentation. That's one of the topics here. Um, I'm oh, sorry, first question again. Yeah, was the cost of cable? Oh, the cost of cable. That's coming out of the study, right? And uh, the estimated cost of something that we'll do in 2025, 28, 2030. It's going to be a you know, fairly wide range of potential costs. But I think the last the last cable that was installed in the area was NSTAR and Marcus Vigor. The short cable, I thought their cable was in the $40 or $50 million range, which they just put in, right? So that's going to be, oops. Oops, sorry. Oops, geez, now they can. Um, so again, that'll come out of the study itself. Uh, so we don't have that hard number yet. So Lindsay, I think you're. Thanks, Emily. Hi, everybody. Um, so one of the other things that's ongoing right now is our energy efficiency technical potential study. And this is our effort to try to understand what's going on in some homes right now. We're doing a, a sample of customers. Um, we're having, we have meters installed and they've been installed for a few weeks already over the summer, actually more than a few weeks. Um, in addition, surveys are going out to try to get at what end uses are being used in the different homes and of those end uses, what does the curve over the day look like in terms of usage? So what times are they using different um, products? What we're trying to determine from this is just how much energy efficiency might be possible on the island. Um, I know that there, I mean, the statewide programs have been available for a number of years and Lauren and the energy office and her team are doing a great job in promoting that. We're trying to understand how much is left and how big of a piece of the pie that might be. So that's ongoing as well. So we also tried to get a little bit more insight into the contributions to the peak load. We found that during peak times, 80% uh, is about residential and about 20% is commercial. Out of the residential usage, um, we tried to understand if there was 
um, more potential in different buckets of monthly KWH usage. And what we found, as you um, can see from this chart, is that really there's potential across the board for reduction in the residential sector. So the purple line on this chart shows the percentage of accounts that are in each usage bucket. So all the way to the left, the zero to 700 KWH per month bucket is really high. They make up about 45% of the number of accounts on the island. In, um, and that's in both residential and commercial. And what we're seeing as you get larger is that that number falls, which is probably what you'd expect. <laughs> um, the orange line shows the contributions to the average sun summer monthly bill usage. So that same zero to 700 KWH per month bucket is contributing about 12 to 13 percent of the uh, the an average summer monthly bill usage across the island. So what you're seeing here is that while there is a tilt to the purple line, showing that the number of accounts gets smaller as you get bigger um, monthly usage, the contribution to an average summer monthly bill usage for the island is fairly um, not uniform, but it's it's um, it, there's <laughs> it's somewhat similar through uh, across the board. So we want to target our any efforts we do to the whole residential sector, and we will target the commercial sector as well. So what I'm going to talk in more detail about now is our alternative approach to meeting some of these energy needs. And this is instead of rolling on additional generation as we would need to plan for normally um, and eventually installing a third cable, this is some, another, uh, another approach. So instead of that, we would try to reduce the demand for electricity during these peak times. We recognize that there are a lot of benef benefits of this and some of them are reducing costs um, increasing the penetration of energy efficiency and other green technologies, um, and just increasing awareness and education of energy conservation. So our proposal, as Tim mentioned, is sort of a proactive approach. We are looking at something that is long-term, and we really don't know yet what we could achieve. So we want to learn more about what we could achieve um, and go through it with you guys, with the community, and, and see what we can do. So we're proposing a five-year R&D project to test some of these alternative methods. It would be targeted for 2015 through 2019, pending DPU approval for funding. We are looking at um, many funding mechanisms for this to try to optimize um, the budgets that are already in place and already being collected um, to minimize costs all around. If we're successful, if things are going really well, we implement these methods and um, there's participation and there's sustained load relief, we're going to file an updated proposal that's more long term. It'll include lessons learned from the first five years, um, any new technology advancements we can roll in, and um, it's, it's going to be longer and it will look at um, potentially deferring that third cable from the 2028 estimated timeline. If it's not successful, if there's not a lot of interest, we, we always have the, the traditional plan. So it's not this or nothing. We always have um, the, the traditional option of rolling on more generators. So as you can imagine, our, our first initiative of choice is energy efficiency. So we're going to tackle it from all fronts. We'd like to increase participation in both residential and commercial and, and industrial. And in the residential sector, one of the first things we want to do is increase the frequency of service. Um, you may have noticed that this year we had an audit week in the summer. Next year we want to do away with the audit weeks and just make it possible for everyone to get audits on a weekly basis at least so that you, there's no waiting. We're also going to have a much more comprehensive marketing campaign and we're going to offer enhanced incentives and even some new incentives for measures that we think will have the highest potential for load reduction during those peak hours, particularly during that 5, 6 to 10 p.m. time frame. Some of those we think will be heat pump water heaters, thermostats, um, dehumidifiers, window AC recycling, 
But again, these are just what we're starting with, and as we learn, we'll continue to evolve what we do. In the commercial sector, we actually want to reposition how the energy efficiency programs are administered entirely. Right now, there are actually two programs that uh, small, custom, small commercial customers can participate in. One of them is the one that's marketed more readily to, to customers everywhere. And that one only offers incentives for lighting and refrigeration. There is another program that offers more measures than just that, but it's not marketed as well. So what we'd like to do with this initiative is um, go through a competitive process to hire a vendor who can coordinate the entire thing specifically for Nantucket, where commercial customers can call a number, they can work with this one vendor, and they can be presented with a whole suite of potential products that they could do, um, that they could install for greater efficiency in their business. We also want to have uh, weatherization in incentives for some of the buildings that, building science-wise, are really more residential than commercial. And so that's something that we're starting to do, I think, this year, but we want to do in a bigger way, starting uh, with this effort here. And then we also want to take a look at um, building codes. What we've seen in some of the, the data is that the new construction on the island seems to be growing. And so we want to make sure that new buildings and major innovations that are going up are as efficient as they can be as well. So we're going to be launching a building code awareness and education initiative that will try to basically get more information about, out there about the building code. Um, this is actually something that national grid energy efficiency programs do on a statewide. And I think they've been piloting it, um, <clears throat> excuse me, recently. And we want to do one specifically for Nantucket. So it involves doing focus groups and trying to understand to what extent the buildings are compliant with code right now. And then doing additional training sessions, additional interviews, and um, educational materials to try to increase the, the knowledge and awareness of the code. In addition to energy efficiency, we also want to look at other technologies and methods. One of these is demand response. We think there's a, a great potential for demand response events through residential central AC. And so we will um, we'll be working on conducting these through primarily Wi-Fi thermostats that are installed as part of the residential program. And customers that opt to participate in this and choose to exercise their option not to opt out um, would be eligible for an annual bill credit as a bonus um, at the end of the year. We'll also be looking at uh, additional devices that we might be able to roll into this if the central AC is, accept is successful. And some of those might be, um, I mean, there are plug load devices for a number of end uses, but um, there are also Wi-Fi enabled window AC units that are coming out onto the market. Um, and there's new technology coming out every day. So again, as we learn, we're going to try new things and um, continue to try to be on the cutting edge with this. Additionally, we're going to be looking at a time-bearing rate structure. This is something that may be a little bit more long-term, um, but we are going to coordinate with our plans with our company's grid modernization effort. Um, but there are a number of things that we could consider here, um, time of use, or uh, tiered rate structure, um, but we are going to be keeping those in mind as we learn more. In addition to those initiatives, there are a couple of other ones that will be going on in maybe a little bit more of an independent way. So volt power optimization is something that National Grid can actually do to increase the effic efficiency of the energy demand on the island. This is something that we are uh, working on potentially for 2017, and it's going to be an independent project not funded through our R&D initiative, but it's something that we're taking into account when we uh, project the load reductions we think we can achieve. So we're actually piloting this technology in Rhode Island right now, and we'll be using lessons learned from that to apply it to anything we do in Nantucket. And finally, renewables. Um, Lots of things are, can be said about renewables, and we know that there are both concerns and um, calls for renewables across the island. Um, we do know that there's a third party project going in near the airport for about two megawatts nameplate of solar, and so we're, we're coordinating with that. 
We also considered um, a proposal for pole-mounted solar, which is um, street, mount, street light pole-mounted solar on the island, um, but for a number of reasons did not choose that. And that's part of our solar phase two project, which is um, national grid-owned solar. What we want to do, I think, particularly right away in the first couple of years, is use the marketing campaign to try to raise awareness about solar and other renewables as well. And then if there is interest in pursuing renewables in a larger way, we definitely want to coordinate and pursue something like that. We do understand that there are some concerns about it, but it's definitely something we're interested in working together on. Okay, so this is a look at the first five years of installations. Um, and I will say that they, they're incremental, so if it, it's not a cumulative graph. Um, the energy efficiency is the blue that's sort of at the base of each year's column. And that's what we expect to install each year. We expect the savings to persist um, for a number of years after the installation year. Um, but this is what we anticipate installing for load relief each year for the first five years of our project. Okay, and so this is another fun slide because it gives you a look at what we think we can achieve in terms of um, avoided roll-on diesel generators through this project. So as Emily said, in the projections, we had three roll-on generators plus the six megawatts of on-site generation at Bunker Road already committed should a contingency situation occur. The graph or the chart at the bottom of this slide shows how many roll-on diesel generators we would need at Bunker Road and at Candle Street, both with this project and without it. So you can see with the project, initially in 2016 and 2017, we're projecting that with the, the current forecasts, if we were to have a contingency situation in 2016 and 2017 where we lost the cable, we would actually have to increase the number of roll-on generators to four. But after that, with our efforts, we would actually catch back up, come back down to three, and we would keep that flat for the duration of the five years. If we didn't do the project, then by 2016, we're already up at five roll-on generators, and then very quickly up to six, and by 2020, we're already planning to roll on a generator at the Candle Street station. So there is a difference. Uh, we, we think that this R&D project can provide um, <clears throat> excuse me, savings that will make an impact in um, what our, our plans would be otherwise. So our next steps. This uh, coming month in October, we're planning to file a proposal with the Massachusetts Department of Public Utilities. We plan to begin our initiatives as soon as possible after we gain approval for that proposal and funding. In, we're, and we're hoping for as soon as possible in 2015. In the meantime, we're working closely with the Town of Nantucket Energy Office to try to expand and promote energy efficiency as much as we can. There's a lot of opportunity within the existing statewide programs already that um, many people can take advantage of, and we want to make sure that everyone knows what that is um, and are, are taking advantage of those. So uh, this year, we actually had a fourth audit week for, uh, I believe, the first time um, in the summer. And um, that was really successful. We had a lot of people sign up and get uh, home assessments. And the next audit week is actually the first week in October, or the full, first full week in October. We've also um, modified the program a little bit so that unlimited LED bulb replacements can be offered, whereas before, I, I believe only about one to three free LEDs were, were offered, and after that, everything was CFLs. So L all LED bulbs, pretty much going forward. And we also started offering weatherization incentives for small business customers, um, such as bed and breakfasts, who have uh, residential style buildings. So there's a lot going on. The numbers up here are for the residential and small business assessment lines if you want to sign up, and um, Lauren's contact information as well. Um, she posts a lot of stuff on her website about what we're doing, so please go there. And um, she is in contact with me all the time, so. <laughs> You, if you have questions, feel free to um, 
to talk to us and we'd be happy to answer your questions. Yes. Sure. That solar is in the first. I'm sorry. Solar is in the first year following this year. Could you explain what the other columns are? Sure. Um, so yeah, solar is that purple one. Um, the VVO is the Volt Bar, Volt Bar Optimization Initiative, which is the company initiative to try to make the um, basically the energy demand is ends up being a little bit more efficiently used instead of the way it is, and it's something that we can do on the company side to do that. That's the big green uh, block in 2017. DR is demand response, and those are the, the red columns starting in 2016. We would anticipate those beginning in 2016 versus 2015 because we would start installing Wi-Fi thermostats in 2015, and then they would be available for demand response events starting in 2016. And then the bottom is the blue EE, which is energy efficiency. Yeah. you something in the range of a, a, a megawatt. Am I getting that correct? And so just take the, the residential program. Um, I was doing some numbers while you were talking. There's 12,000 plus or minus residential dwellings in the, on the island. I recently had a survey, they did 33 light bulbs where they changed from light bulbs to LEDs. Mm -hmm. Average light bulb saves 50 watts. And so if you get 20,000 light bulbs, you get your megawatt. Mm -hmm. And so at the pace that you're going, if you're doing around, you know, around 1,000, which is about right now, you're doing probably three or 400, what I see, 4,000 light bulbs in the month of July in the audits that you did. Mm -hmm. It's not unrealistic to think of light bulbs alone, something that simple you can achieve those numbers. So I guess my, my point or my observation is the number you're expecting to get from energy conservation seems very doable. Yes, and um, we hope that it turns out that way. <laughs> um, we, we've got a lot of stuff going in energy efficiency wise. Um, some of the assumptions I think that we're using in energy efficiency could be considered conservative. Um, and if we see more than that, then we're excited and we will definitely uh, adapt our, proje our projections in future years based on what we see. Yeah, so, so I just wanted to, to just, I, get, I think the point I was trying to make was um, if, if the average house has 20 or 30 light bulbs, if they're anything like mine, and there are 12,000 homes, there's, there's some place around 250,000 light bulbs. So we as an island can do something as simple as get aggressive with helping you change residential light bulbs and probably make a very inexpensive big difference. Yes. Agreed. Thank you. Hi, I noticed you were talking about heat pump for water heating, hot yes. water. Um, what about the possibility of using hot water on demand systems, which save more than 30% as much energy as conventional hot water heaters? Um, that actually, those actually are available currently through the energy efficiency programs as an option. Um, we're pursuing heat pump water heaters because we think during peak um, they'll save even more. But if you're interested in an on-demand heater, you can definitely get one. There's information about the current mass save uh, incentives in the back of the room in the folders, as well as information on how to sign up in October. about any part. It doesn't have to be about what I was talking about. Yeah. When you talk about the contingency situation, with a cable going out, um, you mentioned that the outage could last in excess of days. I mean, at least a day getting the generators over here. How does that uh, response compare to the other service territories you have in Massachusetts? I mean, are we, are we have an extended, a longer period by virtue of being an island, or is that consistent uh, with other neighborhoods that are transmission accessible by other means? If you guys want to come back up. Well, obviously, you're an island, right? You got two cables, uh, so if one goes out, you're, you're happy. Well, right? So at the end of the day, it's not as easy to restore here on the island. It's just that simple, right? Uh, but, uh, but again, the good news is it really is only a relatively small window 
in the really hot, humid weather and three or four or five days into that heavy, hot, humid weather that we've got to worry about this stuff. So even come two o'clock in the morning, the loads may be low enough that we don't have to worry about it anymore, right? So when we, t we're just, we have to think worst case. And so if worst case is it takes a day or two to get generation on the island and wire it up and get it synced in because the loads are just so, so heavy for so long, then that is probably the worst case. But in most cases, there's a lot of switching that can be done. There's other things that can be done that will be shorter. So in terms of reliability in Nantucket versus other places in our system, you know, you get more high wind than other places in our system. I mean, so that's an issue that's just one of those things, right? So, um, but we do have numbers. We can compare Nantucket to the rest of the system if folks are interested in what those numbers are and, and have been historically. So not a problem there. So, so I did want to, just address your, your uh, time of use or time bearing rates uh, that was brought up a little earlier here. As you know, a lot of the surcharge is already collected in just the summer months, right? Two and a half cents or so per kilowatt hour in the summer months and a, and a smaller number in, during the winter months. So it's that sort of thing that's already occurring. But once we get additional metering and things, uh, Lindy talked about the grid modernization that the regulator is running. It's a whole big plan to turn to, to get into the what we call the smart grid that'll accommodate many more types of resources, intermittent renewables and that sort of thing. But it'll also help people understand that the price of power does vary greatly by the time of day and by the amount of demands on it. And what we do and have been doing for a long time is charging people a, a relatively fixed price for that. So that's something that needs to be looked at and see what folks are interested in doing, whether they're interested in, in, in actually participating in some of that as well here. Um, our, our challenge is really pretty basic. You know, if you've got a couple of teenage uh, children with smartphones, a lot of folks' cell phone bills are higher than their electric bills. You know, it was like the breakup of Ma Bell 15 years ago. You know, we, a bunch of us who were around then looked and said, hey, can I, oh, I, I can save 15 cents a month or whatever it was. And so a lot of us didn't do much about it, right? So the same thing happens with the electric bills. Even though they're high for folks, a lot of people have grown accustomed to that and they may not want to do anything. When we talked about Lindsay's comment about demand and response, we're talking about managing air conditioning load, not shutting anything off. No one's talking about turning someone's air conditioner off all afternoon or all night, right? Because I don't know about anyone else in here, but I can't sleep without my thing running if it's really hot and humid. And no one's talking about doing that. We're talking about simply cycling it so instead of being set at Call it 70 or 71 degrees, and actually set at 72 or 73 degrees. And if everyone does just that little bit, it actually turns into a lot of demand reduction or load relief if everyone participates there. And it's still real hot outside, but real cool inside. It's just not, it's only a degree or two less cool than normal. That's what, when we talk demand response on air conditioning, it's not shutting it off. I want to make that crystal clear because people just simply wouldn't accept it, right? They just wouldn't accept it. And it is voluntary, and as uh, Lindsay says, if, you, if we've called events and you've participated, you will get a bill credit at the end of the month. The project that Lindsay's running for us right now in Rhode Island does that and pays people, if they let us manage their air conditioner, A, we give them the, the Wi-Fi programmable thermostat, which for the younger folks in the, in, in, in the area, they could play with their smartphone all day and night and change the temperatures, right? It's internet enabled, you can see what's going on on, on your thermostat. There's even other uh, gizmos that you can get uh, along with it. But that's where that part of the audit, that's part of the original thing, so that if you're inclined to participate, you, you can do so. We want to make, so, make it so folks can participate if they can. And some days you can, some days you can't. You got a house full of people, they are just coming off the beach, and you want to keep your air conditioner where it is, you simply hit the override button. But most of your other day, if that isn't the case, you can let the uh, system just raise your temperature ever so slightly and again as, as the more people we get to do that the less that impact is on, on all different customers yeah in the back um, with the um, cables being brought to nantucket over the history of the two cables have there ever been a failure of either cable not of the cables themselves the, the, the problems we've had are just like the, the ends of the cable where they connect to the mainland and where they connect here typically we really haven't had uh, actual problem with a cable. You know, the last physical break we had in undersea cable was when uh, a cruise ship dragged an anchor through Newport Harbor and pulled out the cable that we had going from Newport, Rhode Island, serving Jamestown Island. And they, they, they just dragged the anchor. And uh, that's ripped the cable up. All right. So typically these are physical things that occur to the cable. That's why the possibility is really quite a very low probability, but high impact event. 
I'm glad to hear this talk about energy efficiency. I'm all for it, and I commend you for, for dealing with it so much. But let me come at it from a slightly different angle. National Grid is, to some extent, in the unusual position of trying to get customers to buy less of their product. Um, if going down the road a few years or a few decades, if energy efficiency doesn't work and the other things on the chart don't work or the demand increases faster than anybody thinks, if we need a third cable, which I know you're trying to avoid, but should that happen at some point in the future, can you project what that would do to the Nantucket electricity rates? Again, without, so two things. One is you're right, we're asking people to use less. So the good news is whatever you do today, you're gonna to reduce your energy bills going forward, no matter what happens in the future. So that's the good news about it. The second piece is in terms of the price, again, we don't have the price of the cable yet. That's part of the needs assessment. Um, as an example though, right now on average folks are paying approximately two cents a kilowatt hour for the two cables that are already in place, the cable surcharge. The first cable in 96 will be I think it's 15 or 16, it's actually fully paid off. So that average of two cents or so will drop practically in half sometime in the 15 or 16 range anyway. That's just going to happen. Um, and if indeed we've got to pull together and, and install the third cable sometime in the late 20s or early 30s, we do run through all those numbers, be able to help people understand what the impacts are. Uh, the reality though is if there's more people using more electricity, it'll lower the cost per unit for everyone, won't it? So if that's the case, hopefully the impact won't be any greater than it is currently. But again, until all the numbers are done, and even the numbers when we get them done in early 2015 are gonna simply be a, 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 a point in time of, hey, at today's cost and everything else, we think it'll cost kind of this much money. But remember, we're talking about actually installing it almost 10 to 15 years later. So obviously the prices will usually go up over that long period of time. So really can't give you any sort of estimate what you'll what the difference will be. Um, I think the reality is the price of supply in New England has been very variable and it's gone high. Right on your electric bills, about half of your bill is supply because we don't own generation; we simply deliver electricity, and the other half is all the delivery costs, right, for the local wires in the street, for the cables, and for the high voltage transmission systems. So the, the challenge we're having in New England is because of uh, natural gas uh, transmission constraints, not getting enough natural gas into, into New England. The power plants don't have enough power, so they've got to be paid to actually stockpile a bunch of oil typically in the winter like they did last winter, and that's causing some significant price changes in that supply piece of the bill. So we just have to understand there's uh, most aspects of the bill that, that are out there are really beyond the control of national grid, we can only control our delivery costs. And that's why we're working so hard on a project like this. How can we take some of the, we're collecting about $300 million a year from our customers in Massachusetts just for efficiency. We're also paying all of us subsidies for renewable energy, probably in the same uh, ballpark, a few hundred million dollars a year. How can we leverage those types of resources that we're already all paying for, again, to optimize our spend on the systems like this. And that's why we're gonna take this time to do this project for four or five years. We're actually working with the Energy Efficiency Advisory Council and the Division of Energy Resources to try to figure out, can we just take more money from the efficiency dollars that we're already collecting and do more of these unique things for a demonstration project here? Because what we learn here, we'll be able to apply in other parts of the system. We have low constraints up in the North Shore in Boston where it's very difficult to site equipment. So what we can learn here, we can help other customers in that area, again, it's all about optimizing the spend so that we minimize the impact to customers, but keep that electricity flowing reliably and safely. Let me go back in time then. When the first two cables were put in, how much did that cost and the amount of the surcharge on the bill works out to what percentage of the bill? And those figures we already have, but... We're fortunate to have our old friend Mr. Fredericks in the audience who was involved with both of those cables and he knows that number far better than I ever would. I like that. Right, that was good. <laughs> the, the, the question you're asking I'll answer a different way. When we, when we, when we came up with the idea of the first cable, uh, really to Tim's point, 50% of your bill was based on the cost of oil and the average electric bill was about 17 cents a kilowatt. 
Uh, today, I think the average cost of an electric bill on the island in the summer is about 17 and about 15 in the winter. So in, in effect, after we paid for the cable, um, your rates back in 1996 went from 17 cents with a cable surcharge down to 12 cents. And the way we did that was because we could buy a mixed basket of energy, which was cheaper than oil at the time, our energy portion of your bill was dropped from 8 cents to 2 cents. And the cable itself cost a little over a penny and a half in the winter and 1.7 cents in uh, the summer months. When we did the second cable, we merged those into two different bonds, one a short-term bond and one a long-term bond, hoping to levelize the cost around two, two and a half cents, two and a half in the, in the summer and a little under two cents again in the winter. But it's really interesting that here we sit, I don't even know the number of years now, 17 or 18 years later, and the price of electricity when we first energized the cable has finally caught up to what it is on the cable. Electricity is such a great deal, isn't it? It all comes, it's really driven by the price of energy. And I think we did do the math and both cable surcharges uh, come out to an extra 15% premium on Nantucket versus what people are paying on the mainland. Fifteen percent. Yep, that makes sense. Yep, yep, that number makes sense. Anyone else? Here we go. So I'm a uh, electrician on the island, and uh, definitely commend the efforts towards efficiency on the retrofit. Um, Nantucket's booming right now. Thank God. Um, what are the initiatives towards new construction? And what I'm trying to get at is lighting, in particular, is. I'm going to go to a residential home that 80% of that usage, you know, that's the goal. So as an electrician, I have no incentive residentially to put in energy efficient bulbs. That's my choice. Incandescent and halogen are still cheaper, at least on Nantucket. So the question to you is, is there any way to make some type of initiative towards new construction. No, and, and, and I think one of the things, you know, uh, Lindsay talked about the, the codes and standards that would, you know, you could get them potentially to require those bulbs. But I think a, more of that, though, is really getting down to, 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 to the streets to the real people doing the work every day and asking them, what do we got to do working together to figure this out? Because you're right, there's a, there's a big opportunity we miss when someone puts up a new home, whether it's a 2,500 square foot ranch or someone puts up a 30,000 square foot, uh, you know, uh, uh, cottage, right? So that's the challenge we have together is to figure that out. And that's something that we don't have the answers uh, to that today. But I think by working with the community, we can we definitely, we did have a session in the spring, was it the spring? Where we did bring in some of the contractor community, some of the realtor community, and really got some great ideas from them. And again, as we develop our plans going forward, we'll try to incorporate as much of that stuff as we can. I guess what it comes to is creatively, I don't want to pawn it on to my commercial clients, because there is a way I can do it is commercially, but, and I understand that with the Flexco and everything is that it is going to be mandated, but it, there's still a, a rather large loophole. No, I, and, we understand. Yeah, okay. We got to figure out how to. So I think maybe working with the two local electrical um, supply houses here that do give immediate savings and rebates for commercial clients, but not currently residential clients. Yep. Yeah, we we'll have to think about the new job yeah, yeah, great. Oh, right in front here, right. I just want to add one comment to, to what, he, what he's talking about. What's, what's bizarre to me is they can come audit my house and I get 35 free light bulbs. This gentleman probably did a house in the last month that was 12,000 square feet and had 60 recess cans. And he could call for an audit the day after he got it energized and he'd get them for free. But he can't find a way to get them inexpensively or reasonably oh, priced. Fine. No, ex absolutely. Yeah. That's definitely, yep, yep, yep. Definitely got to work on that one. No question about it. Right in front here or, or in the back? Any other questions? Right there, right. Oh, here we go. No. Yeah. Um, are you almost finished, or are you got another whole section, or are we just talking now and asking questions? Is there another segment, is what I'm saying? No, no, we're just asking questions. Just saying, okay. Yep. Well, first, I've been, uh, I didn't realize I was, okay. 
I've been working in the propane business for 27 years, and I've kind of watched all this whole thing kind of come to where we are today. And um, so I'd like to kind of say a couple things. We're at a different, we're at a peak now. I think that where the growth of both products is going to be slower, but still growing. We grew in the 90s, I can tell you, that was when we were growing like crazy. Should have put two cables in, but you didn't know it. Um, and you're kind of stuck because there hasn't been a piece of hot water baseboard put in probably for 10 years. Everybody wants air conditioning. It isn't because it's hotter. It's because they want it. It's available. There was nobody putting in warm air heating systems in the mid-80s. I mean, a little, but not really. So we're stuck, because everybody is putting in split loops now, which you didn't mention. Uh, well, you may have had it, but you didn't really explain it. it. Heat pumps isn't just the traditional heating system. You've got these split loop things now, where you can bang out air conditioning and almost have central air, not quite. I call it the hotel room air conditioning system, because that's what it really is. But they're also putting in heat with it. So now we have less propane being put in a home and a more electricity in a house that just has, you know, just a regular home that was built 30, 40 years ago, whatever. And so what I'm saying is electricity is like the fuel of choice. So you're, you're caught where you're trying to get us to use less, but everybody's putting in more. It's, it's a very difficult position to be in. And you're never going to have natural gas here. So if we, you wouldn't have this problem if we had natural gas. Well, like one but of the we apps, don't have it. Yeah, and, and, and you, know, you mentioned the heat, heat pumps and the, and the mini splits. Those are fabulous for air conditioning. You're it's right. crazy. And even nowadays, you can even do a lot of good heating with them. Yep. Um, and maybe on the island, it's more of a balance where you use the heat pump more or less for the air conditioning and use the propane for the backup heat source, right? Right. There's, there's different right. levels of mini splits you can get. Some are going down to zero degrees and getting heat out of that air without any sort of propane backup. And others don't, but either one of them is going to give you air conditioning for typically cheaper than a, a window. Third, yeah. uh, well, it's, it, it's funny. It's a third of the peak demand of the draw. The problem is because it's there and so the thermostat's on, you're actually probably using more energy over the whole summer to keep your house at a, at, at a condition at a particular temperature, right? So, but it's not so much that using the energy over the summer, it's during these peak hours that's really driving everything. And so it's not the, uh, we, so we're, Technologies that can limit that peak load is what we really need to work on. And that's why heat pumps are absolutely perfect. So actually, you get to a ground source heat pump, even better, right? So there's a lot of opportunity just in that sort of market and a lot of things we need to work on it and, and, and help people understand through the marketing, working with Lawrence Group and everything else. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, the, the other thing is um, that the houses, and I was trying to explain a better way now, existing homes that are already using electricity for whatever, are using more because they're putting in air conditioning. Yeah. So it's not just a new home that's more efficient, using less energy, it's still using more. It's a kind of a less is more effect that we're in now. It's, it's, it's wild. I mean, we, when I first started, the island was burning about 400,000 gallons a year, now it's almost six million. And it's all grown in the same time frame that we had the diesel generators downtown and switched to a cable in 96. So it's, it's a, it's difficult. I mean, two months a year is the is the problem. I mean, it's obvious, and 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 so uh, I think it's going to be a little bit of everything. It isn't going to be one thing. It's going to be a lot of things. I know you've listed it, but to me, the biggest problem is the, is uh, the way we insulate. There's a lot of confusion about the building code. Houses need to be encapsulated until we get everybody understood as to how a home uses less energy other than the appliances, it's going to be a long time to figure that out. It's going to take years to get these. It's going to take a lifetime to fix the houses that are already built. Yeah, no question, because, you know, the weatherization, the installation takes a long time to pay itself off. But you're right. It's just one of, a, as you said, it's a whole menu of options. Some people pick some of them. Some will pick all. Some won't pick any. 
right? They won't care, right? It's just that's that's the key. We're going to have an interesting um, uh, experiment going on in the next few years here. We're we're uh, finally connecting Block Island in Rhode Island to the mainland. Uh, we expect, frankly, the load to go nutty on Block Island too, because people will go away. You know, the price of power is going to drop like a stone. Um, and they're going to do all kinds of stuff. So we're expecting a similar thing that we saw in Nantucket from the late uh, 90s into early 2000s to happen out there. And we'll see if it occurs or, or not. It would be very interesting to see what happens over there. I thought someone told me it was 30 cents. Which was last summer, not this summer, it was 45. 45, okay. So they don't put in a lot of air conditioning when they have 45 cent electricity. <laughs> Any other questions? I thought, thought I saw a question in front. Anyone else? Yeah, in the back. Oh, she's coming around. Hi. Thank you again for doing the energy efficiency work. I know it's harder, but it's a wonderful thing. Um, and I came in late. I'm not sure if you talked about the problem of second homeowners leaving their houses running while they're gone. Yeah, I think that's one of the marketing things we really need to work on is to help people understand that every, everyone can do something, right? I mean, and, and if those second homes that folks have, and they have uh, access to their energy use at that home, and we can get them engaged in, 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 the, in, in the issue here on the island. I think a lot of those folks who have those really want to participate. They want to be neighbors, right? It's, it, and we just need to be able to tell them more. I think one of the challenges we have with these sorts of pro projects is that the amount of marketing and or outreach you need really is quite high. People really need to understand this, have that conversation with one-on-one. -on -one, and it's something that we just have to really work a lot more on. And I think, because again, so there's going to be different sort of marketing campaigns. You hate to use the term marketing, but it, it is what it is, right? Uh, for certain groups of, of customers on the island. And uh, we're just going to have to figure out which one works and what one doesn't work. And that's the beauty is we have quite a bit of time, really, to work on this, all, all these things together. It's not like something we have to do tomorrow or else kind of thing. So, Yeah, in front again? How many how many businesses is that or are there in that four thousand category? Is it just a handful or well you can see it's about two or two percent of the total number of accounts on the island. And they account for about oh ten percent or so of the energy use. Now the challenge with this graph is that because most meters on the island are simply kilowatt hours that accumulate over time. We know what people use for the month, because we have to bill you, right? What we don't know in any real granular sense is how much you're using per hour. How, what impact is your use in your home and your business during that 7 p.m. peak hour in July? We don't know that. That's the survey. That's the needs assessment that Lindsay talked about, where we're, we installed a lot of meters where we can get that interval data to better understand what that load curve actually looks like on these peak days. Uh, and that's a real important piece of information we need. We know from the, from the substation and from the cables exactly when the load is used. But really, when you get into these types of how we bill these customers, you know, when you have a, only a $4 a month customer charge, which takes care of the customer service and billing and metering, you only have $40 meters, right? And so that's all you have. So when you go into more uh, expensive or interval meters, it's something that you, but on a test we can go through and figure out what those are and what those load curves really look like. And that'll help us narrow into some of the other options we have to help customers manage their load a little better. Yeah, in the back. A lot of, a lot of what you're suggesting is uh, something that everyone here maybe understands because they're interested in this, but most of the consumers just get their bill and they look at what the bill is. Do you ever include in the bill any of this information, how people can save? It would seem like such an easy solution that's geared to Nantucket people. So if you're a seasonal resident, why you should shut your home down? If uh, you are putting in light bulbs, why not get LED? There's nothing simple. It's always very academic. Yeah, I mean, we have bill stuffers, right? They're not very effective. I mean, people get their electric bill, go, oh, 
open it up and go, yeah, right? They don't really look at it very well. That's the marketing that Lawrence team's really doing a, a great job so far. What we're hoping to augment as well with additional marketing to those groups because those bill stuffers and the bill really, people don't usually read them is, our, is what we find. What if you gave them a savings where they saw their amount and said, you'll save 25% this month if you do the following? Yep, that's a great sort of, and as we, develop, as we do more of these projects and get those case studies, it's exactly the type of marketing we will help for, have for people to say, hey, if you've got a house like this, look at these other four or five people who did it, here's a case study, here's what they did to manage their load. It's absolutely critical to pull those together. And again, part of the whole pro project going forward. And we also know it's critical to engage caretakers because many times residential users don't even open their bills or pay their bills. So um, we're aware of some of these unique challenges yeah, in this market. Uh, kind of going into the comment that Bobby had about building new houses and uh, you know we're changing up all to LEDs. Um, we just finished out two houses in Sconset and they had full banks or five, both houses are over 5,000 square feet. And all the air conditioning units had like Sears of 13, 14 through the whole banks, except for a mini split that went in. So they're, they're choosing on the bid standpoint to choose almost the lowest efficiency. I figure they're only being used for a month or two. What kind of interactions happening or can happen, you know, with the house, the new house that are being built? So we're not pulling stuff out, trying to put higher efficiency stuff in later. Well, I think that's part of the new construction that we heard from the fellow in the back uh, from, from the electrical side of the house, is that what's the messaging we have to give those people? Uh, what are the case studies we can provide for, for, for those groups of customers as well? Um, what kind of rebates can we provide? Potentially, there's even mm -hmm. ways we can actually have what we call um, upstream uh, rebates, where actually when you go to the store, the rebate's already built into the price of what you bought. So there's that sort of opportunity we, we have here on the island too. And uh, obviously the building codes and standards, right? That's a big issue. I mean, building codes and standards, people think about what size, uh, you know, two by six, two by eight do I need for this span? You know, what's, what do I need for this? And then trying to get people to help understand building codes and standards around energy efficiency is really kind of, really out of a lot of people's comfort zone. So that's going to be a really important piece to, um, in terms of helping understand that. But that's a statewide program. That's not unique to Nantucket. That's very common, spec building especially. I think we've seen the speculative building kind of drop off dramatically, but I'm, it's, I'm sure it's coming back uh, in, in, in some areas. And how do we make sure that whatever they buy uh, is at least as, it can be as efficient as it can, but we also make sure the price point is a place where they can explain it to their clients, right? That's a, that, that is a, really quite a challenge. But I think that's where the building code and standards are really gonna help out. And again, as we move forward, we're gonna to try to get as much input as we can on these plans and try to continue to develop them. This won't be a static issue where we, here's a set of plans and we're done. I mean, the project, Lindsay's running in Rhode Island. This is the third summer she's been running it and every summer we've got something new and different for folks mm -hmm. to try, which are different from the, from the prior two summers. Keep all the other stuff, but add, just keep layering on new stuff. And it's definitely a learning process. I mean, what we've presented here is what we're planning to, to come out with. But that's not to say that we wouldn't change something in the future. Everything that we learn, we take into account and we try to be as nimble as we can to provide the best services to get the most efficiency. I have two questions. The first is, what will Cape Wind do to our electrical costs and then the second one is as you upgrade the distribution stations on Nantucket are you increasing the size to allow for um, the installation of alternative energy sources on Nantucket? Well Cape Wind uh, is uh, obviously uh, really a supply issue it's going to connect right, right back to the 115,000 volt system that's on the, on the Cape uh, so that's designed to uh, through price suppression manage the supply costs uh, over time over what they would have been going forward. So that's uh, out, out there in the, in the various studies about that and where the DPU had already approved those, the, the, that, that, that contract. So that's kind of in play. The other piece, and, and the handout, if you'll see it, we, um, Emily brought some handouts that talk about, yeah, exactly what, that's what we're doing, is doing what we can to, to uh, improve the reliability as much as possible on island. And anytime you change something to something newer, 
by default, it's usually uh, much more uh, conducive to other sources. I mean, if you put in a lot of renewables, solar or wind, there will be things we'll have to do at our substation that aren't currently in place. Um, but if they happen, we do you know, extensive studies of those types of resources, and we have to make sure once they go online, they can't affect any neighbors in terms of blinking lights or any other issue here. So we do a very detailed study to make sure that they're not gonna impact the other customers. So that's all done in process. People can't just willy-nilly connect something uh, without, our, without our review. And a minimum, they need us to know about it because otherwise we won't put the right meter in and they won't get the credits that they should get, right? So it kind of makes people come to us as well to get the right meter and get put in the right programs. Are you sizing the distribution stations now to work with their cable? Or do you not have to go back and update things again? No, the distribution system is being sized to the load on the island with some growth built in. Because once we put a wire up, it's good for usually 10, 20 years anyway. So that those cables are going to be properly sized. Now we got to be careful not to go too big, because now we need a lot more poles, right? You know, wire is heavy, and it, there's typically 150 to 200 foot spans between poles. You put a lot of heavy wire, you've got to bring those poles closer together, right, to 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 to, to handle the weight, and you got that issue as well. Uh, so. There's a lot of work going on here. When we do our planning studies, we look at both the local distribution system and the source here. Anyone else? I, I cooked a bunch of cookies in the back there. <laughs> I pressed the apple cider. No, I didn't actually. Whoever brought them, thank you so much. Uh, there are refreshments in the back I saw there. Um, and Lauren, Lauren, did you want to have any closing uh, remarks here? To just want to thank everyone for coming anyway, but. No, just that this is going to be an ongoing dialogue with the town and the company, and uh, I'm sure we'll be having another forum as uh, there are other updates to share with the community, and um, that I'm a resource for the community if anyone has questions or how to learn about how to increase their own personal energy efficiency. So thank you. Great, and we're around to, for other questions. Thank you. Thank you very much.